Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Okay, Danny, let's get started. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot, How Doers Get More Done. This week, we help out a homeowner who absolutely loves her little dogs, but she's having a little problem that we suggest solving that problem by installing a few pavers. Yeah, these concrete pavers are not only will keep the dogs in an area of the lawn where they're supposed to be, but it'll help create surface that the water will drain away from the house. So, you know, that's important as Mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to share a simple solution, how to make a homemade disinfectant for killing germs around your home. You know, we hear a lot of homeowners that are a little intimidated about electricity, but one project that's pretty easy to to tackle is replacing a single pole light switch with a dimmer switch. There's so many type of dimmers out there, including those uh, that are controlled by apps and many other ways, and it's much easier than you might think. That'll be our project of the week. And we also get a lot of questions about, can I lay one type of flooring over another type of flooring? And often you can, but more often than not, you can't. But in any case, the podcast question a week has to do with laying carpeting over an existing floor. And we'll tackle that question coming up. So we have all this information for you and a whole lot more. So let's get started. Let's get right to the hotline. We have Kathy on right now from New York. Kathy, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. Uh, We live in southern Tennessee now. Oh, okay. um, where Where it's been an extremely rainy winter. Um, unfortunately, our two dogs relieve themselves as soon as they step off our backyard deck, which has kind of created this smelly, muddy mess. Uh, and it also slightly slopes towards our deck. And so we were wondering if there's any kind of materials that we should use uh, to try to dig this out or just help. Okay, well, certainly. <laughs> well, at least the dogs are getting off the deck. A lot of times, uh, um, I know my, my wife has a little bitty dog, little Ricky, and uh, little Ricky does not like to get his feet wet, the mm-hmm. little brat. And uh, so when it's <laughs> when it's raining outside, um, it's no telling where he will show up. So, uh, yeah. but, but I'll tell you, looking at the picture that you sent, and I appreciate you doing that, I, I'll tell you... Um, pavers i think would be a great way to go here here's a okay. couple couple reasons um one you're able to change that slope that you're speaking of that will allow it to be um slanted to one side or the other or back away from the deck and it'd be very easy to dig out a, a place there you can go from your deck all the way to the fence or just go out three or four feet and you just remove that vegetation you can get a, a couple few bags of the crushed limestone that they sell along with the pavers that you could put down there rake it out kind of tamp it a little bit and then put these pieces in the thing about pavers that are such an advantage in many situations is is that water can drain down through it. It's not like okay. concrete that you, it's going to have a sheet of water. So it drains down on it. It has texture so that it, um, you know, is skid resistant. And most likely the dogs will go, um, will, will will hit that, and then they'll get out on the grass. They won't, you know, so at least you're getting them to go left or right and not directly okay. as soon as you step off. But uh, I really think the pavers would be a great way to go here. That sounds good to me. I've got my husband trained, but I just can't get the dogs trained. (laughs) You think he's trained. He might be sneaking out there every now and then. (laughs) Oh, geez. (laughs) Well, I do appreciate that. You know, we'll try it, and I'll send you a picture to show you how it came out. Yeah, please do, Kathy. I think that'll work out really well for you, and I hope you have a great week. Thanks. You too. Okay, thank you. (laughs) Yeah, training the dogs might be easier than training the husband. (laughs) The other thing is you could, she talked about training the dogs, if you brought them out on a leash— uh-huh. And brought them to an, a more appropriate area. Did sooner or later get the sort of idea, so mm-hmm. you could try that as well. Yeah, that's a good idea. Great idea. It's time for our best new product segment, brought to you by the Home Depot. How doers get more done. In recent years, it's become very popular to refinish furniture to create an aged antique look using chalk paint. The paint is thick, so it doesn't drip as easily and covers well with very little preparation. Specialty painters often mix their own formulas to achieve 
achieve a flat finish that can be sanded to create a distressed look. But now bare chalk decorative paint makes it easy for DIYers to create a trendy look with less hassle. You simply apply the paint, distress the surface if desired, and then apply the decorative wax. What you get is a flat sheen with a velvety smooth finish. The paint is tenable to over 500 colors, and the buttery formula is easy to apply on old and new wooden furniture, cast stone, concrete, even metal surfaces. This means you don't have to be a pro to get professional results and create a one-of-a-kind accent piece. Now, for more information on Bear's Chalk Decorative Paint, log on to Home Depot. Dot com. Boy, I have heard chalk paint over and over and over yeah. over the years. Chelsea absolutely loves it and has done some, you know, some wonderful things. You know, you have a piece of stained furniture and, you know, a lot of times people will go, man, you can't possibly want to paint that. But then when you see some of the results of it, um, especially some of the more modern looks with the light grays and the different um, shades of white, um, it can really make an old piece of furniture look brand new. Yeah, yeah, and plus, if you have a piece and you have a lot of stained wood pieces in your home, you'd be surprised if you just paint one. And chalk paint's a great way to do it because it gives it a sort of an antique or distressed look to it. And you don't have to change the, you don't have to strip the whole thing down to bare wood and there's not a lot of work involved. And you can add a little color to a room where everything else might be stained pretty dark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great way to go. Great weekend project as well. Right now, we're going to be joined by Lydia in North Carolina. Lydia, welcome to the show. Thank you. All right, tell us what's going on there with these uh, cabinet issues. Okay, we have uh, just a couple of, I'm calling them small issues. One is they are about 20 years old. Mm -hmm. It's in a condo small area but anyway the finish which is a glaze uh, they're craft made cabinets and it's a glaze finish around the edges where the formica uh you know meets the cabinet the, the countertop right that needs to be refinished and the second issue it's the same cabinets only they're in the bathroom and there's red permanent hair color splatters hmm. on them mm-hmm and we do not have any idea how to get that red off. We're hoping that it will be a Mm touch-up, but we are, you know, mostly concerned about it not looking like a touch-up. We want the finish to be uniform, but we just don't know how to accomplish these two little things. Yeah, it is a little bit of a challenge, especially when you have a factory finish on the cabinets. Do you have any idea on the craft-made color or finish um, do, do you have a number or a name of what that finish is? I do, and I did contact Craft Made. However, that is has been discontinued. It was discontinued in 2010. They suggested to take it to uh, Sherwin Williams for color match. Okay. All right. I, I, I think yeah. I think that's a great uh, a great way to go. Boy, I tell you, the color matching is better than it's ever been before. And a lot of times they'll have cross references between a um, factory cabinet color and uh, an exact formula that you need. But I believe if you get that, and and is are the cabinets the same in both the areas in your home? Yes. Okay. They are. I think if you do that, um, and then you're able to get that, and then very, very carefully with a good quality brush, maybe even a, a foam brush, is to lightly, lightly sand anywhere uh, that you have the red coloring, and then just, uh-huh. just kind of, you, you, you may want to touch that up, step back, let it dry, and you may end up doing um, the entire piece of trim or sections of trim so that you don't have just a spot right in the middle that you can go corner to corner and um, fill it up that way. Um, I think that that would work pretty well. Joe, I don't, I don't, I don't think there's any way to get that red coloring off the cabinets without damaging them because it's going to take something pretty strong. Yeah. You don't want to sand it, Lydia, because of course you'll sand off the stain and the paint and then you're starting all over. What I would recommend is, and I think Danny alluded to this, is just try covering up one or two stains on one door. Everybody makes a paint now that has a primer and a paint in one product. But in this case, I would go with a, two separate products. They make a primer called um, Restoration Primer, which is, is a really okay. thick primer that covers pretty much anything. Um, I know Zinser makes one. There's a company called Zinser, Z-I-N-S-S-E-R. And touch up the stains with the restoration primer make it as smooth as you can so it's not obvious and then go over it with top coat if restoration primer doesn't hide this 
red dye, then I don't know what else would. I think you would have to mm. sand it off, sand it off. But that's what I would do. Mm-hmm. Get get some restoration primer, then get the top coat paint and get it color matched. That's a great idea. Get a color match that any home center or paint store can can do that. Bring him bring a door or drawer front or something right. that's the same color. Okay. And as far as the edging in the kitchen, you know, it, it's worn. There's no damage to those edges at all. It's just, you know, 20, the cabinets are 20 years old. So right. we just want to, how do we get that remaining and, stain and, and, and paint off and then okay. go over it? Well, now, with it being laminate like that, or you mentioned Formica as a brand name, um, you should be able to use a uh, acetone. Um, I would start with maybe mineral spirits, but you may have to go to acetone in order to remove that coloring. But because of it being a plastic material, it's not absorbent like the wood. So you should be able to um, work that off of there without damaging anything. Okay. Well, the edges are wood. Oh, they are wood. Okay. Well, I would, that, you, yes, you, the edges yeah, are wood. you would have to pretty much, is it the same color as the cabinets? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you do the exact same thing in order to um, uh, that you're doing on the other. There, you might go from corner to corner so that you have that okay. consistency uh, throughout. Okay. But, well, Lydia, thanks so much for being with us on the show. I hope these little problems will get behind you soon, and you can not have to worry about uh, that particular uh, challenge that you might be having around the house. You know, those are the kind of things that can stick with you, and you see them every time you walk in that room, uh, but you don't have to keep putting up with it. There's a lot of simple ways that you can solve that problem. Hey, we're going to share with you seven home smells that could be signs of danger in your home. One of the first ones, fishy smell. Now, some people refer to this as kind of a burning rubber smell or maybe even a kind of a urine type of smell and this could be something electrical in your home that's overheating and actually melting it's insulating plastic or rubber which certainly could lead to a fire so unless you've been fishing and have the the remains (laughs) of the fish in your garbage can this is something that you need to be aware of and also an ammonia smell sometimes you'll smell of a strong ammonia and it's often in one isolated spot you won't find it ordinarily throughout the whole house or even an entire room and often it's a small animal may have died inside a wall under a floor or even in a deep in a closet you never know it's often a mouse if it's a mouse you know the smell will dissipate pretty quickly if it's a larger animal you know it might be kind of might last quite a while and it could be overwhelming um, a litter box can often if you have multiple cats can also be a source of ammonia so check those out and tracking down the animal and removing it is obviously the first order of business if it died in your walls but finding it and getting to it is a challenge yeah that can require a little drywall work there hey another smell um number three is a damp musty smell now this usually will signal mold or mildew within the house but if you use a hygrometer to check the relative humidity of each room in the house which you can buy these for less than 10 bucks online or at home improvement stores now if you get readings above 50 percent on your relative humidity you need to run a dehumidifier or you can also apply an antimicrobial spray to carpets, curtains, and fabric um, covered furniture in any room that has high humidity and or that musty odor. Very typically in downstairs areas, whether you're a complete basement or half basement, a lot of times that will be the source of a lot of this type of smell and dehumidifier will generally take care of because it can develop into something that does what will cause you a respiratory problem. Number four, how about a smoky odor? You're smelling smoke throughout the house. Now, we're assuming this is not a fire, of course, but just a smoky odor. Um, first, make sure the chimney dampers are closed because often you'll have a downdraft and you know any smell of smoke in the chimney itself will come down into the room and into the house. Um, if that's not the problem, try cleaning and scrubbing the fire box, meaning the inside of the fire where you have, fireplace where you actually have the fire. Um, there are plenty of, you can use TSP and there's, plenty of soot eaters they're calling like for cleaning at those areas um, so scrub those if it if after clean closing the damper and cleaning the firebox doesn't help then you might want to call in a professional chimney sweep have them clean the whole area and number five of our seven home smells that could be signs of danger chemical smells from new furniture carpet or paint 
And yes, I am uh, experiencing that right now with I bet. with my new home and all the different glues and things in there. But it's not too bad because we used a lot of the low VOCs or low volatile organic compound materials in the house. But a fresh coat of paint, a new piece of fresh board furniture, or new carpet can off-gas these VOCs that are not just unpleasant to smell, but also really unhealthy to breathe. So when possible, remove any uh, pressed wood furniture and carpeting from its packaging and just let it air out in your garage for an hour or so, preferably overnight, before bringing it into your living space. If that isn't feasible, once you have it installed in your home, open all of the windows in the room and run fans to circulate the air for at least an hour and for as long as you can that day. That method also works when you're um, painting interior walls. Number six is a sewage smell. That typically comes from a pee trap not holding enough water. Under every sink and toilet and tub, there's a curved pipe that holds water to keep sewage gases from backing into the house. So take that off, clean the trap, and make sure it's holding water. And number seven is rotten egg smell. This could be dangerous because a rotten egg smell might be a, a natural gas leak. Now, if it's just a mild rotten egg smell that's occurring only when your hot water is running, it's probably not a gas leak at all, but rather a small amount of odorous sulfur in the water. Sometimes you and a plumber can, you and or a plumber can solve the problem by shutting off the water line, leading to the water heater, using a hose to drain the tank, then refilling the tank if necessary. And you can find out all all of the information about the seven home smells that could be signs of danger and how to drain your water heater by going to todayshomeowner.com. Thank you so much for all the wonderful calls and emails we've received this week on our Today's Homeowner Hotline and through our email, uh, being able to send us a, an email. You can do that anytime by going to todayshomeowner.com slash ask. And if you'd like to pick up the phone and call us toll free 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 800 946 4420. We always like to feature a few of the calls that we've received that are recorded calls from our hotline. We want to make sure that we get those answers for them. I have mold in my bed on the ceiling, and I want to find out what non toxic um, product I could use to get rid of that uh, mold. Okay. All right. Well, um, a lot of times people, the first thing they want to do is uh, go to the laundry room, grab the a jug of bleach and start spraying it around. That is not what you want to do. You'll cause more problems and potential health problems and you'll do anything else. But if you use a the powdered form of oxygen bleach... And then you mix it up really well with some hot, hot water. Spray it on there kind of sparingly in the areas that you have. Let it work a little bit. And then instead of rubbing it, you're going to want to kind of... Um kind of just um, take a rag and just kind of hit it, just kind of daub it a little bit there. Blot it. Yeah, there you go. To try to, um, you know, pull that mold and mildew out, uh, that should be very successful in doing that. However, what caused the mold is the thing that you have to think about because it just doesn't pop up on its own. So you may want to have someone go up in the attic directly above that. Hopefully you have access to that and make sure you don't have a little leak of some kind or condensation or some type of moisture that's causing that because mold and mildew won't be there unless there's something contributing the actual moisture to it and also we talk a lot about over the years wet and forget number of products they have they have an indoor product that is a spray formula that also will work very very well i was watching a show but i don't i don't have the liquid that you add to the paint so the paint brushes mark don't show on the kitchen cabinet the kind of product that you add to the paint so the, the brush mark don't show, thank you very much. I will really appreciate it. You're very welcome. The product is called Flowtrol, and that's F-L-O-E-T-R-O-L. It's a latex paint additive that greatly improves the flow and the leveling of any water-based paint, primer, stains. Um, it's made by a company called Flood, the Flood Company, and they've been in business since like 1840 or something like that. So they make some really good products. And it's only about seven bucks a quart, I think, and you mix it, follow the directions. I think it's th one part of flow trawl to three parts of paint. But that'll take out all those brush marks. I want to remove uh, wallpaper. I mean, it's vinyl, and the backing on the wallpaper has like a gauze uh, mesh on it. 
And what I found out is they never put sizing on the wall uh, sheetrock, and it was never painted. What is my best way of trying to remove that uh, vinyl uh, wallpaper? Now, shouldn't it be a law that anybody that doesn't size their wall properly <laughs> has to come back and actually remove the wallpaper off of it? Wouldn't that be a cool little That'd way to do it? That would, that would end that process. Absolutely. That would, they, would, yes. they would stop doing that. <laughs> well, it's a very frustrating part of home improvement when you're you know, faced with removing wallpaper because sometimes it can be very, very difficult. But we have a, a great article on our website that will take you by uh, step by step through it. We'll make sure that that's placed on this week's um page for, from this week's show on our website at todayshomeowner.com. And what you need to do there is, first of all, if it's vinyl particularly, you need to use a little, small, simple, inexpensive tool called a paper tiger. That'll perforate the face of the vinyl. You just rub on it. It, it makes thousands of little holes. That way, when you spray this formula on it that I'm about to tell you about, it'll get behind the, the wallpaper and actually start dissolving that glue that's holding it there and making it so hard to get off. Now, again, we'll, we'll put this right on the um, page of uh, todayshomeowner.com so that you don't have to necessarily write it down. But here's basically what it is. Uh, take a five-gallon bucket, put three gallons of hot, hot water in it, then 22 ounces of DIF, D-I-F, wallpaper remover concentrate. Then a few other odd uh, things to put in there, a quarter cup of liquid fabric softener, that really helps for it to hold on to the surface. One cup of white vinegar. You have to put white vinegar in everything because it's a magic formula. And two tablespoons of baking soda. Now, you mix all of this together, and you'll want to keep stirring it as you're using it. And you can paint this on with a large brush onto the area that you're wanting to take the wallpaper off. Or you can actually spray it with a pump-up sprayer, which makes it a lot easier. You just want to really saturate it. And then for the real stubborn paper, what you have to do is take a lightweight plastic, a lightweight painter's plastic, and you just push it against the wet wall. It'll stay there. It'll stick right to the wall, and that'll allow it to kind of capture the the work that's taking place in order to uh, it, it separate that from a wall. It works amazingly well, and uh, that's a real special formula that you can use anytime you're removing wallpaper. One more call. Hi, this is Mike from Beaver Creek, Minnesota. I was wondering if you guys could give me some tips. I have a 20 by 30 rough. I want to put tin on it without taking the shingles off. And I was wondering if you could tell me what to do and not to do. The sheets of steel are 16 and a half foot long by three and a half foot wide. Thank you very much. I enjoy your show. Oh, thank you, Mike from Minnesota. Um, it's a little hard for me at this brief time to tell you how to install a metal roof um, without seeing what you've got there. Um, it depends on how steep this roof is and how accessible it is, how high up off the ground it is. It's typically not a do-it-yourself project, but um, there are some roofing companies that have instructions, so I would contact the manufacturer and get instructions for how to properly install this. But one of your questions, part of your question was, you wanted to put this on over existing shingles. I assume these are asphalt shingles. Um, depending on the condition of that roof, that might not be a good idea. If the roofing is in really bad shape, and if it's not, I'm not sure why you're covering it up. But in any case, if it's in really bad shape, I would recommend stripping it off, which does a, several things, including allowing you to inspect the sheathing, the plywood sheathing underneath it to make sure that's in good shape because you don't want to put a metal roof on top of this old roof. And then what happens if the plywood's rotting out from under you? Then what? You want to start removing metal and shingles, asphalt shingles? So I think um, Danny and I are in agreement that it's almost always best to remove the roof and get down to the sheathing and then start from scratch. Because it really doesn't end up being that hard to do. And, uh, of course, different areas that you live in the country, sometimes it's harder to get rid of things in terms of a uh, landfill and so forth. And, and some might argue putting that much in the landfill that, that doesn't decompose very well is not the best thing around. But still, when you're looking at your home, you want to do it right. You don't want to have to face another problem right down the road. Hey, we really appreciate all the many, many calls that came in the Today's Homeowner Hotline and encourage you to call us anytime, 800 800- nine four six forty four twenty and you can certainly send us an email at any time. We make that very easy. Just go to todayshomeowner.com slash 
ask. I hope you're in the same situation that I'm in, where you really enjoy working with the people that you work with. I mean, that makes it so much nicer when you put to get, work together on a project. You're working together as a team. You can laugh along the way. You can pick on them a little along the way. I hope you're in that environment like I am here as well with our, with our whole team. And one of the things that's really cool during this time of the show is when Joe breaks out another simple solution for us. All right, Danny, you may have read the news lately. There's been some talk about germs and how careful we must be around germs, right? Well, here's a spray disinfectant, which are, of course, great for killing germs on many household surfaces, but store-bought disinfectants are pretty expensive, and some of them aren't all that effective. So here's how to make one affordably at home, all right? So here's the recipe. You mix one cup of water with one cup of rubbing alcohol, and you put it in a spray bottle. Then you add, and here's the key ingredient, add 20 drops of an essential oil that has antibacterial properties. Not mm. all do, but here are some that do. Lemongrass, eucalyptus, peppermint, orange oil. Not all of these. You just need to pick one. Put 20 drops in there. Mix it up and spray it on any surfaces that people touch. And this is important. Once you spray it on, this is true of any disinfectant, including this one. Once you spray it on, you have to wait several minutes for the alcohol and the essential oil to kill the germs. If you just wipe it right off, it's not going to be effective. So spray it on. And again, any hard surface, doorknobs, toilet seats, you know, any, anything people are touching regularly. And then you come back with a dry cloth after you know, you've waited the several minutes and just buff it with a dry cloth just to remove any excess. And what you end up with a surface is not only clean and deodorized, but also sanitized. Oh, man, that right? is great. So a lot of it's people, really affordable. A lot too. of people are listening to that because you have so many disinfectants out there and you wonder, you know, what it, which one really is effective? You don't want something that, that's too toxic. Um, right. That sounds like a great idea to be able to do that. Name those essential oils again. Okay, so there now there are probably more, but these are the ones that I know of that have antibacterial properties: lemongrass, eucalyptus, peppermint, or orange oil. And since orange oil works, I suspect any citrus oil would work. I, I'm lemon oil might as well. But if you Google it, you'd probably see a list of them. Those definitely are uh, would be appropriate for this as a disinfectant. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Hey, if you'd like to see uh, a few simple solutions, uh, um, they're 60 seconds long, and there's five, there are a few of them. 500 of them plus, and uh, you can see each and every one of them at today's homeowner.com slash simple solutions. Uh, also, we're very proud. I announced a, a week or two ago about our presence on Crackle and Crackle Plus, a streaming platform that's extremely popular these days, and uh, we will be appearing um, for a long run there. Um, um, in about two weeks. So I uh, certainly want to remind you about that. And if you feel like binge watching a little bit right now of the Today's Homeowner television show, you can head over to Amazon Prime where we have at least 15 seasons there and six more seasons will be hitting the airways very, very soon. And if you want to see where you can um, check out Today's Homeowner television in your neck of the woods, just go to todayshomeowner.com slash local listings. Now it's time for our DIY Project of the Week, how to install a dimmer switch. And you can see this at todayshomeowner.com slash installing a dimmer switch. Now replacing a standard wall switch with a dimmer is a great way to improve the lighting in your home. Here's how to install one. First of all, turn off the power to the light and switch at the circuit breaker. Then remove the cover on the existing light switch. Unscrew the existing light switch and detach the wires. Attach the black dimmer switch wire to the hot wire and the white dimmer switch wire to the common wire, just following the instructions that came with the switch. Then attach the dimmer switch ground wire to the ground wire in your home. Screw the dimmer switch into the wall box and attach the cover back over the dimmer. Turn the power back onto that circuit and test it out. Make sure it is working properly. This is such a, a great way to improve the lighting and give you a little more flexibility on that. And as I mentioned earlier, you're also able to um, buy some of these dimmers that you can put um, hook in with one of your apps that you're able to actually control it from anywhere at any time with your phone. But before you attempt to install a dimmer switch. Keep in mind that dimmer switches cannot be used with compact fluorescent bulbs unless the package states that the bulb is dimmable. That's one of the things that have happened with a few and they go, what's wrong with this dimmer? Why is it not working? That should solve the problem. 
Now it's time for our podcast question of the week. Now this one says, um, I'm wanting to install carpet in the home I just purchased, but it's all on a floating floor, laminate flooring, and I was told that it all had to come up before the carpet was installed. I've also had some say that they've never heard of this, and I have a lot of flooring, so what's your thoughts on this? And any help would certainly be appreciated because I, I don't want to have to remove it if I don't have to. I am on a fixed income. Thank you in advance. Joe, you know, uh, any of the floating floors, any of the laminate floors, I could see you could put carpet on it, but that's going right. to just feel weird walking on it. It's just going to have too much movement. Ultimately, right. I think it would probably wear it out. Yeah, not only that, but um, you know, if you put down wall-to-wall carpeting, it's typically installed with nailing tack strips. If you nail these tack strips around the perimeter of the room, they might restrict the movement of the laminate floor. Laminate flooring or any floating floor has to have a um, space and expansion space around the perimeter room so it can expand and contract with humidity. If you start nailing it down, you know, what's going to happen? It might start buckling up under the carpeting. Um, so, yeah, I think, and plus, because it's a floating floor, it should have come up really easily, right? It's not floating floor. That's right. That's what I was not, thinking. Right? It's not and, attached and to, to the subfloor. And to tell you the way. truth, you probably could use that flooring elsewhere if you if you yeah, had you a place to, to use it. If you can unsnap it. They used sure. to be glued together, but now right. they're not, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah so that might be idea. able to be used. I understand that um, some of the flooring like that uh, originated in some of the European countries where when you sold a house, you took your cabinets and, in this case, your flooring with you. Absolutely. You know, so whereas if you Sweden. did, if yeah. you did, yeah, if you did that here in the United States, you'd probably get arrested. But um, <laughs> because that usually goes with the house. But there in Sweden, I understand that they do that in Germany. They do that a lot. So um, that's why I think it all, um, you know, was originated and so forth, and then migrated to the United States. But um, I would say uh, take up the laminate floor before you put the carpet in. Yeah, and the other option, of course, is put down area rugs. You don't have to do anything. That'd probably be the most affordable option. Um, I assume. Uh, this this listener considered that and decided not to, but th- that's another option. Just put down um, area rugs where you need them. Hey, if you have a question for us, we would love to have you send it to us, and we'll do our best to get it answered as quickly as possible. It's really easy. Today's homeowner.com slash podcast. And we really appreciate all the great reviews we've been getting. Keep them coming. Uh, we get a few uh, cool comments from time to time. This one came in from Trapstar, and he says, nice content, dude. So Nice content, dude. Yeah, how you like that, man? I assume he's referring to you because you're more of a dude. (laughs) And another one here from Mr. Trax. Uh, Nice video, lovely content. So we really appreciate you (laughs) taking some time to to send us anything, uh, you know, um, uh, things that you might want to hear on an upcoming podcast. And certainly appreciate all the great comments we get each and every week. That'll pretty much wrap us up for this week. I'm Danny Lipford along with Joe Truini. Join us next week.